Okay. Um, so good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for making time to join us tonight. My name is Michelle Parker. I'm with the Second District PTA. I'm the VP of Leadership, um, which means that I help develop leadership capacity uh, at all of our PTAs across the city. We have I don't know the exact count right now, but it's probably around 62 PTAs in San Francisco Unified School District. And so we as a board are here to support you in um, supporting your own schools and help lead advocacy efforts and things like that. And so here we are tonight at a 411 meeting. This is something that we started at the beginning of the pandemic because we saw a need across all of our PTAs uh, to connect with each other and not feel so isolated while we were all going through the beginning of that, but also because people were looking for information on how to do their jobs better at their schools. And so we've continued these not quite as often. We used to do them every week at the beginning, first year of the pandemic, probably. We do them maybe a couple of times a month now. Um, and this week is Inclusive Schools Week. And so we wanted to take some time to talk about how we might make our PTA meetings and events more accessible and inclusive. And so that's our topic tonight. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. And we have some other presenters with us tonight. Julia Martin, who is our special education ombuds person for the school district, and then Suze Dana, who is actually our arts education chair uh, with the second district PTA, but has been on the special education community advisory committee, and so also has a lot of experience with this topic. So that is our quick um, overview of why we're all here today. And my slide's gonna go. Okay, so um, if you just joined us, Please include your preferred pronouns after your name. You probably by now know how to rename yourself in Zoom, but if not, it's the top right-hand corner where you see the three dots. Just click on that and click rename, and you can add your preferred pronouns. If you'd like to also add which PTA, school, or organization you're from, you can add that on your name, or you can post that in the chat, as some people have been doing. If you would like to use closed captioning, just click on more in your toolbar and you will see captioning. Um, click on that and then you will see show captions or you can look at the live transcript, whatever works for you. Please go ahead and do that. We did not have any requests for interpretation, so we will not be having interpreters tonight. And if you happen to have a question, we are a bit of a small group. So please feel free to raise your hand and we will catch your question. And if you're more comfortable, please go ahead and type it in the chat and we'll make sure we get to it. Um, so we will get you your answers the best we can. And if we don't have the answers, we will find them for you later. <laughs> um, okay, so the objectives for our meeting tonight. We wanted to increase awareness of the movement around supporting students with disabilities and also importantly provide some ways that you can make your meetings, your PTA meetings and events more accessible and inclusive beyond what we typically think about, which is making sure you provide interpretation and translation. There's a lot more to making um, our meetings more accessible and inclusive than that. And so we're gonna get into some of that tonight. And our agenda is to talk a little bit about Inclusive Schools Week, and then we'll help increase some awareness around a lot of the, the words and terms and, um, and just the, the environment of uh, disability, student disabilities and, and awareness around what that is like and what, what you might encounter as you learn more about this. Um, and then we're gonna share a bunch of tools and tips and some resources. And if you have ideas and things that have been helpful for you as you've learned and gone through this journey, please feel free to share. Um, we, we are all on a learning journey with this. And so, and we all have different areas of expertise and experience. And so please feel free to share um, so we can all learn from each other. And so to get started, we're going to, I'm gonna turn the time over to Julia, who's gonna talk about Inclusive Schools Week. Thank you so much. I had to find my mute button here. Um, really appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to be here with all of you. Um, so first off, just want to talk a bit about Inclusive Schools Week. And if you can go to the next slide, um, we are pretty happy that it is once again Inclusive Schools Week. And um, we have a chance to not only celebrate, but also really look at um, how we're doing, right? So 
it's not just a time to say, okay, we're doing this thing or we're celebrating inclusion, but it's really a chance to focus in, learn about disabilities, learn about the intersection of disabilities with other categories of identity. There's been a ton of movement and advocacy um, really talking about intersectionality in the last few years. Um, and so it's really made the discussions around disability and diversity much more rich and representative of all of our students um, and really helping to make sure that our students, our staff, our families see themselves represented in a very real way in our district and also looking at the ways, you know, just as important as part of Inclusive Schools Week, what are the ways that we as a district are not inclusive? Where are the areas we need to do better? Where do we need to improve? And so it's really a chance to kind of self, self assess where we're at and really reflect. Um, and we have a link here to the inclusion resource guide. Um, we update this every year. It's input from so many different departments and families and parents and learnings that we've gathered um, over the years, um, all kind of in one place as a resource for folks. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so really want to highlight a couple of things for this year's Inclusive Schools Week. Um, the first is our keynote event, which is happening tomorrow night. Um, I know how many folks are aware of um, San Francisco's role in the birthplace of the disability rights movement. Um, I'm wondering if anyone could share their knowledge. So I didn't find this out until after I was 50. So if you don't know, you're in good company. I was, you know, had not something I'd heard about. Anybody want to share what they know? Um, and if you don't or don't know, that's okay. Um, so there's a film called Crip Camp on Netflix that is great. It's free. It's one hour, one. <laughs> um, it was nominated for an Academy Award. It's really a wonderful film. Um, and it talks about the birth, the beginning of the disability rights movement, how it all kind of started and stemmed from these young adults coming together in a camp for students who at that time in the 60s were referred to as cripples. That's why they call it Crip Camp. Um, and these individuals really found a sense of self, a sense of community, and most importantly, um, self-advocacy. And they all eventually moved out to San Francisco and the Bay Area and became incredible advocates. And they ended up taking on the federal government um, and fighting for um, the rights of individuals with disabilities to have access to our public buildings, to not be discriminated against, and for children not to be segregated and to be able to go to the same public school as everyone else. Um, and they did this through taking over the federal building here in San Francisco. It's the longest takeover of a federal building in our nation's history. Um, and the reason the disability advocates were able to be successful was because of our community in the city. So the Black Panthers came in and fed them breakfast. That was one of the reasons they were able to stay so long is they were fed by the Black Panthers. Cesar Chavez was in support, the Pink Butterflies, like everyone came together. Um, and it really showcased how strong the disability community is. Um, at one point, the federal government turned off the phone lines to try and stop the protesters and weaken them. And the deaf people that were there said, we got you. And they did sign language out the window back and forth to communicate. So the, it was a really, really powerful event that is not often taught or talked about. And so we are lucky to have some of the folks that were there as part of that sit, that sit in um, that are part of our mayor's office of disability that are here still advocating in our city. So they and some other younger advocates who are doing really incredible work will be joining us um, tomorrow night. So um, really, really excited about that event. Um, Thurgood Marshall is hold, hosting a special Olympics assembly. This is a virtual assembly. Anyone can sign up and they'll have a speaker um, talking about their experiences, a great young man who has a lot to share. Then we have an art showcase, um, which is always one of our highlight events 
Um, over the last few years, we've had a few of these showcases and students create art that reflects the theme of the year. This year's theme is unity within the community. And um, we get art from little ones, from kindergartners, all the way through to 22 year olds. And we accept all kinds of art, can be spoken word, can be a video of spoken word or dance. Uh, one year we had a student do an interpretive dance of her ADHD. Um, we have had books, we've had poetry, um, drawings, all sorts of things. And we're actually working with the school district to set up um, a space at 555 Franklin in the main lobby to showcase this art. So it's a permanent installation. Um, so really excited and any student can submit their art. It can be a classroom project, but it could also be a parent and child at home submitting art in the form is linked here. Phew. Um, the last thing we do want to share is a book list. So our librarians have um, purchased our central librarians. Um, as you all know and probably remember during COVID, a lot of the books in our libraries went home with the children. And so when we returned, new books had to be purchased. And so our school librarians um, have a set of books that were purchased that represent um, students with disabilities, and they are in every K-5 and K-8 library. And so this week, every librarian has been told and um, that they should be highlighting those books. And our social studies department um, is helping out, and they created a virtual bookshelf with all of those books, and each one is linked to the read aloud version of that book. So. Um, that work has been really amazing. Um, there's some really incredible books, books for every kind of kid, every kind of situation. It's really an incredible book list. So I highly recommend checking it out. So that is Inclusive Schools Week in a nutshell. It's a whole lot. Any questions about events or things or anything Inclusive Schools Week related? in the chat okay good pause and maybe pass to Sue's. yeah i think you are so good at covering it <laughs> nobody has any questions they can post them in the chat though if you have oh actually oh, nancy a question yeah nancy has her hand raised hey, how are you guys thank you um i just wanted to know is the the meeting tomorrow is that virtual yes oh good okay it's virtual and i think that's the registration link there and we can okay put it in the chat Yep. Yeah, so I dropped the link to the PDF of the slides in the chat. It's and in there. You okay. can follow along and that way you can actually click on Thank the you. links that are in the slides. So okay. um, I probably won't be drink, dropping all the links to the things that are in the slide in the chat, but that's a good document to refer to if you want to click on those things. And so I guess I will get started. So um, as Michelle mentioned, I'm Sue, as I'm currently the uh, second district arts education chair. I did serve um, two years on the CAC for special education, and the CAC stands for Community Advisory Committee. Um, and I also had a child that went through the public schools in SFUSD. They graduated in 2020, first pandemic class. Yay! <laughs> um, so, um, so one of the things about Inclusive Schools Week, or the main thing actually, is I think just bringing awareness and awareness to um, disabilities, um, you know, and also things that, and, and it's, it's open more to, um, it's not just for students with disabilities, that was really the main focus and how it originated, um, but it is open to all groups that have been marginalized in some ways. So. Um, at different school sites, you know, people might be focusing on different things depending on the needs of their community. Um, but Michelle, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so one of the things that's really important about Inclusive Schools Week is, you know, what does inclusion mean? Um, and so inclusion obviously is including and accommodating people who have historically been excluded because of their race, gender, sexuality, or ability. Um, and it's different than just say, you know, building diversity in your group. 
it's really inclusion really um, is ensuring that people feel comfortable in the space and that they feel welcome in the space. Um, so that's just one of the one of the definitions we wanted to share. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. And then related to that specifically for um, people that have disabilities and just so you know i'm dyslexic and I put these slides together and I made some typos, obviously <laughs> so. Um, people with two P's or three P's um, so ableism ableism is a term that means um, discriminating against or having prejudice against people with disabilities and in particular with people who have physical disabilities. And I think the reason for that is because it's easy to see when somebody has a physical disability. People who have, um, you know, other kinds of disabilities, like myself with dyslexia, you don't see that right away. So you don't know that somebody's struggling with some sort of disability. So can we go to the next slide? And so that brings us to disability awareness. And you know, the more you know, obviously you you know it's it's better for the whole community and society and so it educates us and like what this says here um lindsay and mcpearson um it helps you become a better citizen if you're just aware you know just like if you're aware of your surroundings if you're aware of what struggles people might be having um you know then it it really provides for a better community overall you can go to the next slide <laughs> so for students who receive um, special education or students with disabilities, there's a couple key terms. Um, so IDEA is the Individual with Disabilities Education Act. And if you want to find out more, there is a website linked there. Um, FAPE, so these are all acronyms, obviously. And one of the things about special education is it's full of acronyms which actually for people with disabilities is <laughs> pretty difficult. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do is make sure that we use those sparingly, but these are some of the most common ones. Um, so IDEA, FAPE, SELPA, and the IEP, and 504. Um, so special education local plan er area, I'm gonna let Julia maybe explain what that means a little bit for um, those that, might not already know. And sure. Then... Um, and so if you have a kid with an IEP, um, you might have noticed on the top of their IEP, it references um, SFUSD SELPA. And so that is a special at local plan area. And local plan areas are similar to school districts. So special education departments are sort of close to school districts, except it's an area that is just um, special education, and it's how the funding is allocated from the state. And so what they realized is for special education funding, um, especially when you think about some of the smaller counties and smaller cities, right, they might have one OT or who needs to go to a whole bunch of different places. So every little city might not have all the resources they need, but they're put together into one SELPA so that they can maximize their resources and their funding. In San Francisco, our special education area, our SELPA and our district are one in the same, just like we're a school district and a county, all one in the same. Um, so it's more about, um, and it's really come, becomes really important when we look at our funding um, and how special education is funding at the state level. Um, so a little bit about SELPA. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, an IEP, anyone who has um, is receiving special education services would know what this is, but it's an individualized education plan. Um, and it's it's basically a document that kind of describes what services and what accommodations a child will receive in the school site. Um, they're both, you know, re uh, legal <laughs> legal documents. Um, the 504 is also it's, but the 504 is really um, 
it's it's a little bit different in that it's it's a document that requires that accommodations be pro provided not necessarily paid for or that accommodations be accommodated let's say so um versus the iep which um that actually is providing services so the district is or the yeah, the district is paying for services to help your student. And then with a 504, like for example, my child had a 504 um, for bulk of their time in SFUSD. And it just meant that, you know, maybe they could get extra time on a test or they could use a calculator. That didn't require um, a teacher or any other paid services, but it was an accommodation to help with their disabilities. So those are some of the key terms and then we can go. So the next slide is kind of, you know, before we move on to the next slide, I wonder, Suze and Julia, um, this stuff is obviously super relevant to, to families who have students with disabilities, um, they have children with disabilities, but I wonder also as we're creating this awareness with everybody here who might not have students who have disabilities who need an IEP or a 504, but why is it important for a, a family um, who has a general education, a student just receiving only regular generation, general education services, no accommodations of any kind? Why would they need to understand what IDEA is or what a FAPE is? What, what is the significance of that? So you can help, what, what, tell us, I'm trying to, to set up the question in a way that I know you'll answer is, um, why does this matter, you know, for people who are in general education? What might they do with this information by knowing it? Instead of just having empathy, what else? Why is it all help? Why else is it helpful for them to understand? Julia, do you want to do that one? Yes. Um, so I'm the parent of a 20-year-old on with autism who came all the way through SFUSD. And um when I think about these questions and when I think about being here tonight, um, I really think it's important that everyone is aware of what these things are. Because when we don't know, sometimes people make assumptions or they think, oh, why is this kid getting special treatment? Or, oh, my kid should get that. Or, oh, this is a thing that you know helps your kid with tests. And, um, for my child, there were many things that were said to him by his teachers or by other parents where they said, you know, I don't think public schools are the place for your kid, right? Or, you know, I don't think this is the right spot for him. Like your, your kid's disrupting all of the other kids here. Um, and it was hard because folks didn't really understand. And when you as a parent are in a tough situation with your kid and you're, you're struggling, you don't really have the resilience to answer, right? And so what I know now is, and, and part of the reason why I'm so excited about tomorrow night and about these kind of events is there was a time not that very long ago in our nation's history where kids with disabilities were not allowed to go to public schools. Like really 504 was a big deal because it was one of the first steps that allowed our kids to go to public school. Um, what was, that was part of what was exciting about it is they said, please stop segregating our children and sending them to institutions. Um, for those of you that are older like me, who might remember Geraldo Rivera, right, <laughs> from the 80s, he actually became famous for doing an expose about a school called Willowbrook. And it was, I shouldn't even call it a school, it was an institution that was horrendous. Um, so, and if you remember, people really, they started finding out about what was happening to students and they started learning about inclusive education or what I remember at first being called mainstreaming. Um, and if you remember the movie Rain Man, right? That was about two brothers and one of them had been institutionalized. And the moral of that, at the end, the conclusion of that movie was not that Rain Man could be with his brother and in society, which is where we are today. The conclusion was that he had to be institutionalized. Um, so we are not, this disability advocacy is a new idea. Um, 
the Individual with Disabilities Act really brought about that our kids, all kids, regardless of their disability, can go to their neighborhood school with all the other children. And we as a district, as a, as a country, have signed on to provide all children, regardless of their disability, a free and appropriate public education. Every single child belongs. And so that's that's kind of what it's all about. And we forget that because it is so new. It, it isn't always what the way it's been. And it's really, really hard work because sometimes those are the kids that are disrupting things, that are having a hard time. And so I always want folks to know, right, if a kiddo qualifies for a 504 and IEP, it's not an easy process for parents. It's really extensive. They have to go through so much bureaucracy. Um, we know as adults, you never go up to somebody who has like a disability pass for parking, right? We just know like, okay, you got the handicap pass for whatever reason you have it, you have it and we leave it alone. For some reason with IEPs, we don't always feel like, you know, well, why? Why does your kid get, you know, we have all this curiosity. And so it's important that we respect folks and we kind of do the learning on our own. And then most importantly, that we're allies to parents because we don't know what they're going through or what their kid's gone through to get that and, and how hard they might be working to support their child. Um, and to make sure their child's included. So anything folks can do um, to just reach out and be a friend um, and be inclusive, it means just the world. So sorry, it's probably a longer answer than you wanted. No, that was but that was great, Julia. I appreciate it. Because so the kind of underlining here, and it's in the last bullet of the slide, is like, this is a civil rights issue. Um, and also, those of you who are here are probably on your PTA board. You might be on a school site council at your school and to be aware of these things so that you can be, as Julia just said, an ally and an advocate as your school is making decisions about how it is providing instruction as it providing opportunities and experiences for students that you can be an advocate alongside families who have students with disabilities. So you play a leadership role that's critical and that's why it's important that, um, that we're all here together. Um, I see that Nancy just raised her hand and, and then we'll move on to the next slide. I just have a comment. So Julia, you talked about all of this is, you know, I'm just thinking as you were speaking, would it be inappropriate to even have like a, you know, like we have meetings, like tomorrow's our meeting for, you know, our PTA meeting to have something like this informational. I mean, I struggled when I had my foster son with me for five years and it was horrible. He, we finally got a 504 when he was in middle school. And I'm just thinking, and it doesn't have to be when the, the family that's struggling with their child, but all of us, everybody. You know, we gave a presentation um, earlier this week at a school and it was like, okay, this is the first time we're doing this. We're going to start with an ability awareness workshop and um, for the staff and the staff member, there were several staff members that were like, yeah, you know, staff members have disabilities too. It's 20% of our population. This is not a small thing. This happens, it's a normal part of the human experience, but we are conditioned not to speak about it. So I, I always think anytime we can lean in to these discussions and you start talking to folks who are like, oh yeah, I have a cousin, I have a brother, I have a child, I have, you know, it's, it's not something that people don't have awareness of. We just don't necessarily lean in and talk about it. So absolutely bringing it up. I never would ask a family to present, but some families really want to share their stories. They, they are really comfortable. So it's, um, yeah. And I appreciate your wording that you say our abilities instead of saying a disability. Because when you say disability, it's almost, an, it's, an, it's a negative. It's not, it's, but it's my ability. It's where I am right now. And my ability and your ability are different from each other's. It, yeah, and we'll know. talk a little bit about um, words. And I do say the term, I say ability, we say ability awareness, but we do use the term. And I, I choose as someone who also has a learning disability, and a, a parent of a child with a disability, I choose the word disability intentionally. 
I don't shy away from it because um, one, it's that is the legal term. It's on top of all of his materials, all of his medical information, all of the legal information about school. And for me, I really wanted my kid to go to college. And I knew that for him to make it through college, he had to go to the Office of Disability Affairs. That's what it's called in college. And so I want us to destigmatize that. I want us to just like, okay, that's the word. It's not a defining word. It's not everything. And so now, and you see it more and more. There's a whole disability culture and awareness and um, disability pride, which is really coming out of that. So really stepping into that space so that our kids feel comfortable because right now only 20% are using their accommodations in college because they're afraid to go into that disability office. We need them to step up and be proud of who they are and use those accommodations. So it's my, my thoughts. All right, shall we go to the next slide or anything else? This is a great discussion. It looks like maybe we're ready. Yep, we're ready. So um, this is a list of various disabilities that you wouldn't necessarily see just looking at someone. Um, you know, and, and for our students, um, each and every one of these, you know, it's helpful sometimes to have accommodations. And so it's important for us to be aware of, you know, that there are all these hidden dis disabilities. And so when we're looking at someone, you know, you just don't know like what, what they are wor working with and, um, you know, why, why they have their accommodations. And um, it's a, it, it's a sort of a comprehensive list, although um, there's obviously more in each of these categories. Um, so that's why it says some examples there. Um, if I were going to talk about something I know, because I have dyslexia, my child has dyslexia, my child also deals with depression. I also have, I'm assuming what's mild anxiety, I have panic attacks sometimes. Um, so I can speak to those things and how they might, you know, um, affect me even in a meeting. So, and there's, accommodations in a classroom, but there's also accommodations that we can do as a group. So when we have our, our PTA meetings or a school event, you know, there's things for each of these types of disabilities that we can consider, um, but you have to know what they are first and you have to understand like what type of accommodations might um, be helpful. Um, one example that I gave to Michelle earlier was so I have dyslexia, so reading is, um, I can read, <laughs> but you know, reading out loud and under pressure is a whole different story. And even like as a kid, um, but even as an adult today, you know, when I go to just a general meeting and people, they always love to say, Lead, you know, go ahead and read the slide. And they make turns and go around the audience and say, please read that out loud. <laughs> That's horrifying for someone like me. Um, you know, it just, and it brings up the anxiety that I also have. So, um, so I'm just trying to point out like some, some different examples. And I don't know if anyone isn't familiar with any of these disabilities or if they have questions about some of them. Um, there's a lot of resources out there to find out more. And there's a lot of these um, are what qualifies somebody for an IEP. Um, and I, Julia would know more, but um, in order to qualify for an IEP, um, it has to really affect um, your studies a, a certain way. I don't, can you provide the definition a little better? Like, uh, So it's not just like you're falling behind or you need tutoring. The, um, the child's learning or the disability is like a chronic, something they will have lifelong. It's not something you grow out of. It's not a temporary situation, but it's something that you look at that is lifelong, that it affects the child globally. So it affects them at school, at home, but really in all areas of their life. It's not just 
when they're in math class, it's hard. It's math class, science class, like every class, right? So it it is something that um, is very broad. And the federal government um, through IDEA has 13 disability categories. Um, so something straightforward like deaf and hard of hearing or blindness, things like that, that we recognize as disabilities, but also um, speech and language, autism, um, other things. And so they have them all in here. I'm not gonna go through them all tonight. I think the one part I always want folks to know is let's say the school district says a child qualifies for special education under autism. It's an eligibility category. It is not a medical diagnosis. The medical diagnosis only comes from a doctor. School district, not doctors, can't diagnose. Um, so this is just the eligibility. They, they qualify for special education services under that eligibility. So, but happy to talk more offline or I'll share my info. People have questions about certain categories. It's an extensive, takes several months to go through this process, if you're lucky, sometimes longer. Okay, so was that, um, Suze, did you have anything more to add before we move on to this next section? No, I think that it's just like, you know, kind of setting the framework for, you know, what kinds of things we might be looking at it that are different than just interpretation and, <laughs> and translation. Exactly. So. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so this next section um, we're going to sort of do as a little interview conversation style here on different tools and tips on how you can bring this new awareness um, into your PTA meetings, both around disability, but also in general, you know, we, we did broaden a little bit in this section about how you can be inclusive. Um, and so, so I'm, we're just going to engage in some conversation here. So um, Sue's and Julia, when you think about ways to make meetings more inclusive and events more inclusive, we have some things that are listed here on this slide. Um, you all who are here in this meeting, you can see that translation interpretation that we just mentioned, but I wonder if both of you want to choose one or two of these to just expand on a little bit. Um, they don't have to necessarily be related to um, to folks with disabilities, but when you're thinking about a PTA meeting or a school site council meeting, what, what stands out to you as an important one to remember? Julia, do you wanna go first? We do have like slides that kind of go more in depth. Into... We could just, do you wanna just move to those? Um, yeah, maybe, unless Julia wants to um, pick a favorite. Yeah. You know, I, I think number one, it's just being welcoming. Um, sometimes, you know, you walk into a meeting of folks you don't know, and there's a, you know, a, a feeling, do I belong here? Is it okay that I'm here? You know, you see new folks come into any meeting space. We'll see it sometimes CAC and they're waiting, you know, is somebody greeting them at the door? Welcome, come in, right? Cause you have members who are gathering and already have their plan, you know, here, this is where we get our food. This is this. Um, here's a list of terms we might be using tonight. Here's our notes from our last meeting. Um, so, you know, make checking in with folks as they come in to see where it is or what they might need help with. Um, also, you know, just like you did tonight, here's the link to the slides. Here's the information so that you're getting information to folks in the way that they can most easily access it. Um, that's, I think, always the biggest. Thank you. And we have a little bit more like to expand on that in a few slides later. So we can talk more about some of those things that Julia just mentioned. Suze, do you have one that you want to highlight? And I know you made the slides, so you may <laughs> want to just forward to another slide. Um, um, is there one that you want to highlight? Um, I mean, I guess for me personally, um, I feel like having, um, materials available in advance, depending on what the meeting is for, has always been kind of super helpful for me. Um, if things are thrown at me, like on the spot in the meeting, I can't actively engage or, or, um, and that's just for me, um, 
so you know allowing the person to be kind of prepared for what they're i mean for something like this where it's more just you're coming to listen or chime in it's not um as important as is important but like if we're doing you know approvals or if we're reviewing budgets you know i need to look at that material offline and not while other people are talking so mm -hmm. i think um that and obviously i mean well there's like a lot of things that are important for all different kinds of reasons but um mm -hmm. that one's one that's always like been an issue for me if i don't have the material in advance i can't and that's super relevant in PTA meetings, right? Both school site council and PTA meetings is you're, there's always action. You're asking people to participate in those meetings. And so we try, you know, there is, we're supposed to provide agendas ahead of time for everybody who's going to attend, but we're not always as good about providing, making sure they've seen that financial report or that they've seen, maybe there's a proposal that a committee is going to make around an event that you want to do at your school and maybe they haven't seen that and so there's always ways we can improve and that's super relevant to pta one i actually want to highlight is um this one around words because um for several reasons um one is that there's so often um especially with our meetings at schools you're not going to always get the same group at every single event or meeting people are busy sometimes they have to work or they have other family things going on and so they don't show up and so you can't count on them having had some kind of context or frame of reference before they come to a meeting and so not speaking too quickly um as you heard earlier don't use acronyms you can use them if you also explain them right so if you're going to say for instance we were in a meeting yesterday talking about school funding and there is something called the local control accountability plan and the shorthand for that is lcap but you start saying that and people who don't know about school funding they have no idea what you're talking about. And so not saying LCAP, but saying the local control accountability plan or the LCAP, which is, you know, a plan that a school district has to put together to talk about how they're going to use the funds to support their students, right? Like being able to explain what you're talking about helps people feel really welcome. Um, and it doesn't make them feel excluded because they weren't able to come to the last meeting. Um, the other thing that's important about slowing down is that people who do need more time to process or who speak a different language as a first language, slowing down helps them process the information you're sharing more as well. If you've got an ASL interpreter, any kind of interpreter, you need to slow down so they can actually interpret what you're saying. So that feels like an important one to me that is so easy to forget if you're presenting or talking and it's, just, it's easy to go fast if it's your native language and it's, you know, it's just easy. It's an easy one to forget about. Um, let's move if on. You're if you're nervous. <laughs> and if you're nervous, it's easy to speak faster. Totally. So, um, so translation and interpretation, this is, we hear a lot of PTAs ask questions about how do we do this? And some are better at it than others. Some have a lot of forethinking with their, um, the administrators at their school and making sure this is happening. Um, but what, um, Suze, Julia, either one of you, I mean, a lot of it's written here, but you want to um, just share a little bit of information about how people might provide both of these. And I do want to say translation is the written language and interpretation is spoken. So if we had an interpreter here, that would be them speaking a live translation while we are speaking. Translation is you hand a written document to a translator who will translate it into another language. So that's the written, just to make sure you use the right word in the at the right um, for the right purpose. What do you want to highlight here? Well, I think that one's important, and I I always mix up the two. So <laughs> it's all it, it's extremely important to know which one you're requesting. Um, I think the biggest thing is know that translation and interpretation services as a department, so it's a whole department in the district, um, is pretty impacted. Folks are becoming more aware that they need to provide translated materials, which is excellent. Um, and the demand is outpacing what our translation department can do. So um, work with your school principal to get materials translated and they can help you with getting materials out in different languages, um, but know that it takes time. So one of the, the challenges 
that comes up frequently is, you know, it might take two or three weeks to get that document translated. Um, and so, you know, there, there are plenty of times I myself have used Google Translate in a pinch and then been in a meeting and had somebody side chat me like, oh, um, that's <laughs> not correct. And that's a mistake. And so I, I don't recommend, you know, you got to plan out. And I see um, Janet has her hand up. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Janet. I just wanted to make a comment about this as both, an, like I work at a school and I also am a PTSA member. Um, generally speaking, SFUSD will not translate PTSA materials. Just, they're just, there's not enough, there's not enough bodies to do it. Um, we find that having um, PTSA volunteers do the translations is the fastest, no matter how you slice it. Interpretation is sort of different because being a qualified interpreter is different than just translating to your friends while you're standing there. And if you partner with your school principals, um, then you can get interpretation services through SFUSD, but it has to be requested by the school and not by the PTSA. Thank you for that, Janet. Um, and I'll just th um, throw one note in here and then see what else Suze might want to point out is that um, it's a smart idea to put money in your PTA budget for translation interpretation um, in case you can find people who are not part of the school district as you're looking because they are limited in capacity. Um, and there are also grants available that you can apply for that are due in October every year from the state PTA. If you don't have money in your budget to pay for these kinds of services, you can, you can apply for a grant. Um, to help you provide those kinds of services. And there are some interpreters that are available outside of the school district. They are often also very busy. So, you know, but we we have slowly been building our list of people we reach out to for the district PTA meetings. Um, several of them are school district um, interpreters, but we have some who are not. So, you know, build build your list and, and see if there's a way you can put some funds in the budget, which also seems like a good fundraising ask. Um, because that's about accessibility and inclusion. So, um, Suze, do you want to add anything else on this slide? I don't have a whole lot okay. um, to add. I mean, I will say that, um, you know, we always struggled. I mean, when the whole time that my child was in, in um, San Francisco schools, um, you know, we always needed translation or interpretation and we tried our best. We're volunteers though. And so it's, you know, there's limited capacity and sometimes limited funding also. Um, so I guess my, my, I would, think like at the beginning of the year when you're planning and you're budgeting, you know, look at the events that you have and look at the meetings that you have and really try to prioritize which ones would be the most important. Um, I can say, for example, at Presidio, um, when we were helping as volunteers, um, parents and new families register, or if we had a big welcome event, you know, we really want to be able to communicate <laughs> with, with the families and, um, you know, the district was overloaded and, you know, lots of schools were having people register directly at school sites and there really is a huge need, especially at some school sites. So um, you, you kind of have to pick, I guess. Yeah, and that's, that's in those situations, you know, I would think that the money spent on interpretation, I would, I mean, Google has gotten so much better. Translate, Google Translate. I use it actually for some personal business stuff. Um, and it's, it's not perfect, but you know, it works and it gets the point across. And if something sounds weird, you know, people will ask, like, I don't understand what that means, <laughs> you know, because mm -hmm. they translated it incorrectly. Um, but, you know, again, it's it, as, especially for PTA, I mean, it's, um, a vol or any other volunteer organization, it's, you know, you can really only do what you can. And I think people super appreciate if you've made the effort. So that's kind of what counts. Google Translate used to be terrible. Like it was <laughs> terrible, terrible. Um, but I will say that uh, I often will start with Google Translate and then send it to somebody who speaks mm -hmm. that language to give them a head start, make it a little faster and easier. The last few times I have sent um, a Google Translated paragraph or something to someone, um, they, they've said, actually, this looks great. 
like even like our SFUSD interpreters who I've had look at things before, they're like, actually, this looks great. And it may just have been that it was not complicated language that was in that paragraph because, you know, there can be dual meanings to things um, that Google Translate doesn't catch. Uh, but it is getting better that there have been several instances where there have and been no corrections needed. That is good. Exciting to hear. <laughs> it is exciting to hear. I have to 100% agree with you. Every time that's happened recently, I wanted to do a little dance. <laughs> so, okay, let's move on because we are we have so much to um, talk about and cover. I want to make sure we have we have time to get through everything. Um, so this uh, talking about listening and speaking, there's a lot to say. We've talked about some of these, but um, again, both you, Julia and Suze, like pick out what feels like resonates you want to make sure people consider because not everybody thinks about these things, right? If you are able to um, to move through conversations and process information without these, these may not come to your mind. Which ones do you want to point out? Um, well, I'll point out the obvious one, the avoid acronyms, which after <laughs> being on the CAC for special education, um, when we were having our meetings, you know, the interpreters were constantly like, what is that? What does that mean? <laughs> you know so we had to be try and be really aware when we were using all of those terms um and then the other thing that um i've gone to a couple city um wide meetings and some other things um and i've noticed like more and more that when they have a zoom for example or maybe even in person it's something new to me um was you know people describing what they're wearing you know I'm a, a white female with long blonde hair and I'm wearing a rainbow, you know, hat. And they would also sometimes describe what are you seeing on the slide? Well, the slide is where it's a list of, you know, terms for listening and speaking. And so that you can, um, you know, make people who are visually impaired, um, you know, see <laughs> see what you're, what you're seeing. <laughs> um, so, I mean, those are things that kind of pop out to me. The other ones you kind of mentioned, and I don't know if Julia has something in particular. I think the speaking slowly and stepping back and listening and letting there be quiet pauses is super important and not something folks are comfortable with. I tend to want to rush through and feel uncomfortable in a pause, but it's really important to give people thinking time, processing time. To just kind of like, all right, let's just hold for a minute. Let's think about this. Um, so really appreciate being in meetings where that happens. It's so true. People are just uncomfortable with silence sometimes. I often am in um, things where you have adults who are maybe teaching youth in more of an informal environment, not in school, where they just, if the students, you know, if the young people aren't responding right away, they think, I just have to rush forward. And I think, hey, you've got to stop, like leave some room. People need time to process and consider. And it makes such a difference when you allow that to happen. And as a facilitator or as a leader, when you act confident in that silence, it really makes a difference. Um, thank you for that. Um, so written words. Um, same question to both of you. Anything here that you want um, to point out about being really important that people may forget about? Keep it simple. <laughs> yeah, Don't for sure. Try and impress anyone with your big words. Keep mm -hmm. it simple. Sue, is yeah. anything you want to add? Sorry. Well, I think along with that, like when you're looking at your agendas, um, also trying to keep those simple and limited because that does allow for more conversation and more input and questions and comments. Um, and then obviously for me, <laughs> the dyslexic in the room, <laughs> I'm always trying to explain to people, you know, that you can use text and things that are easier, um, easier for somebody who has, who struggles reading um, to, to read the material. And, if, for example, something is in all italics or all caps, the whole thing, it is more difficult to read. Um, you know, the size of the font is not necessarily for a dyslexic, but somebody who's visually impaired, um, you know, or like me getting older, you know, I need glasses to see. So, you know, consider 12 point minimum, you know, for your fonts. Um, 
And they also, I we used to joke, I mean, cause I'm a, I'm a designer and Comic Sans is like, it's kind of the joke <laughs> of fonts um, for designers, but it actually is one that is apparently really easy for dyslexics to read. Um, so I, I kind of had to laugh because, <laughs> but um, anyway. Actually, Suze, I want to, um, because I, I can geek out on fonts and things like that too, but people may not know what sans serif means. Can you tell people what sans serif font means? It means that it doesn't have all the little um, ticks and things on. I, that's the best way for me to Like explain. on Times New Roman, which is a really standard like newspaper type of a font, it has mm -hmm. those little lines at the end of each of the lines. Like if you have a K, there's like that little tiny line at the end of each yeah. of the lines on a K. That is a serif font. Sans serif means no serif. So the serif is those little tiny lines at the end of the lines on the, yeah, the letter. So this font that's on this document is uh, sans serif. It doesn't have those little right little ticks, whatever you want to call them, dashes. I right. Mean. Or serifs. But I mean, like if you're describing. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The little lines. Um, okay, and uh, I'm going to move us to the next slide, but those of you who are here and listening, if there are some other things you want to add, just add them to the chat too, because maybe there's things we've forgotten here that feel important to you, so please add. Um, okay, this is the big discussion slide. I'm going to just take it away. Go ahead and take it away. There's, this, is, this is an important one to talk about because as you already heard previewed, like there is not always agreement in how we talk, you know, some of the language we use around this. So whichever one of you wants to take this on, go ahead. I'll maybe let Julia, I think Julia and even Janet can chime in. We were talking about it a little bit. <laughs> well, and this is one, like, I want to give folks a moment to kind of pause and look at it and maybe put in the chat something that they're surprised seeing on a say this or a not this, like surprised where it landed. Because I think sometimes we might have different thoughts. What's your thoughts on the word handicapped? On handicapped? I think it's outdated. I think it's outdated. I think that a person with a physical disability is much clearer. Handicapped is like this broad umbrella term that to me, infant, I can never say this word, infantile, it makes someone seem like a child, like somebody who needs help, not someone who's an independent adult that happens to have a physical disability. Can I answer the question in the chat about why not autistic? Mm -hmm. So my son has autism. And from my perspective, and from many children's perspective, if you say that they're autistic, Autistic is defining them as a human being. If you say that they have autism, then they are human beings first, but they also have autism, which is their disability. Yep, and there's tons of back and forth. Special needs, there's a whole really great article about why not to use the spe term special needs. Um, I like to say because they're... Um, their needs are not special. And because they're not needs, they're legal rights. It's not like a special gift that the school has just decided to be kind and provide services. They are legally mandated to provide those services. And then um, for anyone who remembers the church lady on Saturday Night Live, the word special never means anything good. <laughs> um. Yeah, so I have one comment because, as I said, I put the slides together and I pulled this from um, some information that Julia's put together that's available on the um, the special education uh, web pages. And um, the word disabled, um, I was finding that a lot of the videos and some of the books and things that I was referring to, <laughs> the people called themselves a disabled person or, you know, and so I was finding it a little, um, I, I guess, <laughs> uh, 
uh, contradictory, like I'm saying, don't say this, but I'm going to reference all these documents that more people are saying. this. So um, for me, that was kind of kind of an interesting one. And, and, and Janet and Julia and Michelle all kind of chimed in and said that there is a lot of discussion around what's the appropriate term and some people like one versus the other and um so yeah I, mean, I i would say that i'm dyslexic or i have dyslexia for me it's not um i don't have a super strong opinion about it um but you know like for someone who has anxiety or has depression i wouldn't walk around and say you know, I, i'm not like depressed but i'm i wouldn't say i'm a depressive or you know like i don't that would be weird right i mean because that doesn't make you the whole person so um there's something that's missing here which is i happen to be at a school that has a dhh program um i don't see deaf on here and one of the things that i have heard from actual deaf folks is that they don't want to be called deaf and hard of hearing they only want to be called deaf like i'm a deaf person I'm not, I'm not hard of hearing. I'm deaf. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure I, I clarified that here as well. Yeah. And then I know Yuli has a question about normal, healthy, whole. Yeah. And so I'm wondering a little bit more. Can you tell us more about your question, Yuli? Oh, I'm asking, how come like we cannot say normal, healthy, or whole? Um, I think... And I am not the expert. And all of this, we have many adults with disabilities who are defining for themselves what they want to be called. And so in my reading, what I have seen and in, in talking to folks is when you use terms like that, like neurotypical versus atypical, that it makes it sound like normal is what we should all be. And if you're not normal, then there's something wrong with you. And so sometimes those terms, that's why people have a hard time with those terms. It's all very subjective and it's all evolving, right? So where when my kid was coming up, things this, none of these terms are, many of these terms were normal, were, were what we heard. Um, mental retardation was a medical term that was used, that was in medical, that was terminology that was used. Um, so all of these things shift and evolve over time. And we're at a point in time where a lot of folks are really claiming what they, they want to be called. Um, so I think there's links in this slide on some of the, the thoughts back and forth, right? So there are, are folks that, you know, want to be called different things. So like Janet saying, you know, they don't want to be called deaf and hard of hearing them be called deaf. And there's, you know, different different groups. There's also parents um, or individuals who really want to be said that they have special needs and don't want to say they have disability. So all of it, it's highly individual. And I always recommend asking the person what they want to use, right? Following their lead, um, because they may have some reasons why a certain term does or does not work for them. So I have one more thing to add to that. I mean, so some as someone who has dyslexia, um, I wouldn't say that my brain isn't normal. I would say it's different. Like I have a different way of thinking. It's gonna be different from somebody who has autism, but it doesn't mean that it's bad or worse <laughs> or you know, better or worse, I guess. Um, it just means that it's different. Like I think differently and I have different strengths than somebody who I guess doesn't have dyslexia, you know? So I think that's where like normal, it's it's setting a standard for like that everybody should be a certain way. And that's just not how we are. Like everybody's unique, everyone's different in some way. And some some of these things though, I think cause issues not because like, I mean, dyslexia wouldn't be a problem for me if there weren't standards for how things should be done a certain way. So I'm trying to fit into a society that has certain standards for how stuff is is um, provided or how, how you read or how you do this or how you submit work. And 
you know, if, if it was a different society um, and flipped, you know, maybe, maybe I wouldn't, maybe it wouldn't be considered a disability anymore because nobody would notice it. I, I don't know if I'm explaining myself very well, but really the thought is like, your brain is just different. And that's how we should be looking at some of these versus I wonder, a, a total disability, if that makes, I, I'm not making sense, but. No, I, I personally think that you're making sense. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think it might be also helpful to clarify that it's not, not okay to not use the words normal, healthy, or whole. It's just in this context, when you're talking about somebody's ability, there's an implication. If you say, well, this is a normal ability that implies that like there's an okay one and a not okay one, you know, or that this is a healthy person. Yeah, sure. You want to be healthy and not have the flu, you know, but that's different than saying that somebody who has a disability is not healthy, you know, so it's in this context, those are words that um, can imply good versus bad, as opposed to different, I think, you know, as Suze was trying to explain. Is that yeah. maybe well, and just so it's, it's probably not super clear in this slide, but each of these lines like kind of align with each other. So has autism versus autistic. So people without disabilities, um, that doesn't just equal normal, I guess. So that's where it, yeah. And these are generalizations and, you know, and um, Julia's suggestion to, you can always check with someone to see how they like to refer to this themselves. You know, cause like for instance, with autism, like I have seen, I've read books, I've seen things that talk about people wanting to be called autistic and others do definitely, as you just heard from Janet, don't. So there are different preferences. So you can always ask and people yeah, appreciate the same, way that, the same way that you ask for somebody's pronouns, you know, right normalize it right like let's normalize talking about these things okay let's um we are a little bit over time so we'll spend maybe a little less time on these last few because there's a lot of text on these slides so they're very easy for you to go back and look at you won't need us narrating them for you because they're actually pretty comprehensive um and these are just um the next two slides are just considerations as you are planning meetings and events at your school so when you're thinking about the space, you know, how can you make sure you're accommodating all of the different um, abilities? Is there accessible seating? Is there seating or only standing abilities? You know, are there places for people to see the screen? That's just, these are some examples there. Um, child care, um, again, these go beyond abilities and disabilities. This is, um, this is in general how you can create inclusive environments. So where the location is, how people are gonna get there, how people are gonna get in the buildings, cultural, thinking about um, scheduling your meetings. Um, well, oh, I forgot to put in the notes for this slide. It was uh, the state or the national PTA has a really good page that lists uh, major cultural holidays and things like that, that you could refer to um, so that you're not accidentally planning um, an event for your school on a major religious or cultural holiday that is especially the ones that are particularly important to your community. Um, so finding ways for people to um, embrace their culture and for you not to provide uh, unnecessary conflict there. Um, the foods. And then this next one, there's a link you'll see in the notes of this slide of a, of a document with the state PTA um, that goes into some examples about, you know, this, and actually this is what I was referring to that Julia was suggesting earlier, this creating a welcoming committee. It's, it's a great document that has some scenarios, like maybe it's something that's happened in your PTA. Somebody new comes in, they don't know anybody, you know, what, why is that not helpful? And, you know, and, and so it explains why that might not be helpful. And then it says, here's what you can do so that that's not the experience of that person. And so each of these six colored boxes on the outside give a scenario that is probably happens at most schools at one point or another, talks about why that's not inclusive and how you might change behaviors at your school to kind of flip the script on that. Um, and then this, this middle list is, again, just some, some things you can think about as you're trying to make your PTA more inclusive, that welcoming, socialize outside of your own clicks, right? Clicks happen because you get to know people and you work with them a lot. But remember that if you're only talking to those people, other people might 
not feel welcome. And so how can you sort of go outside of that circle sometimes or using name tags? Because even if there aren't newcomers, lots of people like me, I'm terrible remembering names. And I really appreciate name tags because I can't remember two seconds after you tell me what your name is. So um, so here's a list for you to look at later and I'm including that link that's in the notes. Um, and then Suze, do you wanna walk us through what these last set of resources are and then we'll close because they can look at these also later. Yeah, so we can just quickly go through these. So um, these are some important um, connections for SFUSD. So obviously you've all met Julia. She's here today with from the special education department. You know, actually, um, can you, I'm realizing not everybody may know what an ombuds person is. Do you want to just explain that very quickly? Yeah, um, it is a very um, unfriendly word for someone who helps families and staff navigate special education um, and investigate special education complaints and really just work as a um, neutral facilitator um, in the school district to help people find their way and get the resources they need for children. Thank you. Sorry, Suze. Oh, and then um, these are just some other, well, so Sasha was maybe gonna pop in today. She's um, she's new to the district, but not new to Special Olympics. Um, she's helping coordinate that for the district this year and going forward. Um, and there's an event that's happening this week. Is it on Friday or is it? The virtual one? Okay. Um, the SPEDCAC, which is the Community Advisory Committee for Special Education, it's another great resource. It's um, an, an advisory committee made up mostly of parents that have students receiving special education services, and they have monthly meetings. Um, anyone's welcome to attend them. And then Support for Families is an organization that helps families with students of disabilities and they have a lot of great resources classes and all kinds of things too so and they do that annual event that is like this all day tons of workshops that you can go to whether or not you have a, a child with disabilities it's really awesome yeah so those are some of our connections in sfusd and then the rest are resources there's a page with articles um, if you want more there's Julia's put together a whole bunch of resources on the special education website that you can go. These were some I just pulled out that were kind of highlights um, from that. And the inclusive inclusion resource guide that's been put together by Julia and then the inclusive, uh, <laughs> inclusive we, whatever, task force um, is also really great. Um, so if you wanna go to the next. next I would just say it's a task force. Task and force. many, many district staff. It is not all me. Yeah. There's no way. Yeah. So many, um, many, many folks. Yeah. And then um, this is a, a book about demystifying disability that is um, very, very popular. <laughs> Julia highly recommends it. And then there's a few more books on the next um, on the next page. Um, some of these are pulled from the list. Um, the Dyslexic Advantage is one of my personal favorites. Um, my husband actually read it to my child when they were very young. And there was a lot of this like, me too, me too. And really like feeling empowered, you know, because there's a lot of advantages to being someone with dyslexia. <laughs> um, and then the inclusion reading bookshelf is linked here again. And then again, the website um, has a lot of more, a lot more resources for books and then the next slide and I think the last slide is um videos um crib I'm not gonna say it right crib camp <laughs> is um, the one that Julia mentioned earlier um being different it's normal I kind of related to our conversation it's a really super cute two minute video it's worth watching and then there's a whole um, inclusion playlist that Julia put together on YouTube um, that has these and more. Um, so if you're looking for for videos to watch to find out more about disabilities and special education, it's a great resource. Oops, I think that might be it. I think so because it's not. <laughs> 
now it's just playing videos. It's not letting anybody go to any more slides. So I think that's oh, there should it. be one last slide, maybe. Is there? Yeah. No, it just keeps playing. Well, maybe here, let me try one more. There, there we go. It wanted me to play all the videos first. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. <laughs> and we went a little over. So thanks for everyone being patient and letting us finish. Yes, thank you. And I know there wasn't a lot of open room for questions and conversation. Um, we can stay or I, I know, well, I don't have much to answer. The I am not the expert. These folks know much more than I do, but um, I, we could probably stay a couple minutes if anybody has a question. Otherwise, please feel free to um, reach out if you have questions, all those resources in the deck. We will post this video by tomorrow to our Facebook page, and we'll also send it out in the PTA newsletter next week. So you'll be able to have access to the slide deck and the video and to share with others. And hopefully this was helpful um, and a nice way to celebrate this week. Um, yes, the Facebook page, I can definitely um, get that for you right now. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hold on one second. And um, and actually, I'm going to stop the recording while I'm looking for my Facebook uh, link. Let me stop. And thank you 